Okay, we're, uh, we're about to begin. Uh, it's good to see that the room is not, you know, overbooked, so no one's getting dragged out of the room. Um, welcome to Engineard's sponsored talk, uh, Deep Dive into Docker Containers uh, for Rails Developers. So uh, that's a mouthful, so let's take a look at, uh, at the title. Uh, Deep Dive, um, this is me. Uh, and my wife uh, scuba diving in the Philippines. Uh, we're advanced open water certified, um, and it's beautiful um, underwater, and when you go deeper, it's actually even uh, more beautiful. So we're going to talk about Docker containers. Uh, who among you have used Docker before? Okay, so that's good, uh, it's more than half. But who among you has used a container, but not Docker? Okay, we got one, two. Okay, so this is not an introduction to Docker talk, but uh, we, were, we will look into uh, Docker, I'm sorry, container internals, right? Like well, what, what are uh, containers made of? So, and then I have to be specific, this is, or I have to make sure this is for Rails developers, uh, because when they announced, uh, and I announced RailsConf will be in Phoenix, I was, I was just thinking, oh no, a lot of Phoenix jokes, right? So you've probably heard a lot of these jokes already, right? Like, so uh, this seven Phoenix, one of the organizers, uh, and you know, the Phoenix framework. Some people have moved on to other languages or fr framework, that's fine, you know. Uh, but here, we're here, you know, to say that, you know, we, you know, we use Rails and a lot of people still do. Uh, this is sponsored by Engine Yard, uh, where, where I work for. Um, and we're celebrating our 10 years uh, this year, so please join us tonight. Uh, there will be a party tonight uh, at 7 p.m., so please join us. And we also have a booth tomorrow um, and on, on a Thursday. So Engineer is a great place to run your Rails applications uh, where you can easily scale from one to hundreds of servers, right? Uh, we have 10 years of Ruby on Rails optimizations on top of AWS, and you know, we, we have top-notch 24-7 support. Um, so, but let's uh, get into uh, the talk. Um, these are uh, the topics that we're going to talk about. The reasons for using containers, uh, what are containers made of, and how do you run containers uh, in production. So there are a lot of uh, uses for containers, but here we're going to focus specifically about on deploying uh, your Rails app in a container. Uh, I remember when I started Ruby uh, back in 2006, or a few years after, one of the most popular deployment tool back then was Capistrano, and it probably still is. In some sh uh, shape uh, or form, we still use that, the, the Capistrano uh, way of doing things, uh, at Engine Yard. Uh, we have deployed a lot of Rails applications using Capistrano, you know, big customers, big applications, uh, and it works, and it even still works until now. But here I'm going to try to um, discuss why, why you should, you know, put your Rails app in, in a container. So with Capistrano, you SSH into a server. Um, you, if you're using Git, you're going to do a Git clone, Git pull, install the gems, Recompile assets and maybe run migrations. And it's fine, it works. Uh, you know, we have big apps using that approach and it works. But sometimes when GitHub goes down, then no one would be able to deploy, right? Um, this is not a knock on GitHub. Uh, we use them, it's a great service. But when they go down, a lot of people notice, right? Because a lot of people use them. Uh, so we get a lot of tickets actually when, you know, when GitHub goes down, uh, nothing's wrong with the engineered platform, but when GitHub goes down, a lot of our customers can't deploy. Um, that's only a small, um, small reason though why you should, um, why you should use a container. Uh, but, but let's take a look at what's involved in, in using a, a container. Here you would see that you still need to install Ruby, um, install the packages, uh, copy your code, um, install the gems, pre-compile assets. It's very similar to Capistrano, right? Like, so you're not, it's not a silver bullet uh, that, would, um, that would remove all these steps, right? You're still doing it, but now you're putting it in a container. Um, and once you have that container, um, your server needs 
only to know how to run that container, right? It doesn't even know what's inside it, just run, run that container. Um, and you could run it with other containers. It could be another Rails app if you have another one. You could run it on the same server. Or it could even be something like Redis or, um, or a database, although you know, our DBA is here and he, he wouldn't like that. Uh, you shouldn't run your database in a container. But it is possible, all right? Whatever you put inside it uh, and your host knows how to run it, then it should work. Um, then you could also have multiple servers. Uh, there's no real world analogy to this, but you could duplicate a container easily. You could run it on multiple servers. So now when you try to scale, uh, and we know that Rails can scale, right? Um, you just run a lot of different servers and then on those servers you run your containers. Um, so containers start faster um, and you'll be able to easily run your um, run any code that you could put in a container, which makes the whole process faster. Like your, your developers would be able to release code faster uh, in staging or in production. And you know you, you get to focus on on your, your business problems. But what are containers? Uh, there are a few descriptions that, that I keep on hearing when people uh, discuss containers. One, first is uh, lightweight VMs. And a lot of people uh, don't like this description and because it's technic uh, technically, uh, uh, a container is not a virtual machine. When you have a virtual machine, uh, you, you, you could have a host, for example, that's using uh, this running Linux, and you could have a virtual machine uh, that is uh, a Windows box, right? You could have a guest that, that, that is uh, different from your host. Uh, but with containers, uh, when you have a Linux host, you could only have Linux containers. Uh, there are Windows containers, uh, but we're not going to discuss them. Uh, that's outside the scope of the talk. Uh, so we're specifically looking at Linux containers. But I like this description that it's a lightweight VM because of what I described earlier, that in a container you could put everything on it. In fact, you need to put Ruby, you need to put your uh, packages, like if you have MySQL client libraries, you need to put those inside your container. So for me, it's a good description. Uh, it's a lightweight VM. Next is uh, CH root on steroids. So CH root, um, if you have a directory, for example, uh, you could make that your, your new root. Um, you would still be using the same Linux kernel. So that means uh, it, it's technically one OS, but if you have different subdirectories and you change your root into that, um, you, know, you could do a lot of interesting things. Like let's uh, take a look at this. Um, so here, I'm going, I have an Ubuntu um, server, uh, I'm sorry, Ubuntu directory. And let me just pause that. And you could see that the directories on, on that Ubuntu 17.04 are just, you know, are similar to what you can see in your, uh, in your Linux box, right? But here they're just subdirectories. And you could run ch root, um, uh, you could run ch root, so let's just run it again. Um, so you have an Ubuntu directory, you could ch root into that, and now you're inside a different, a different OS, right? You, you think you're, you're inside 17.04. So I'll check slash Rails conf, it doesn't exist. It exists on the host, but not on, on, on the new root. So here I also have a CentOS 7, Subdirectory, and I could ch root into that, and you know you would see that it's in its own. It, you could see the version of the OS, but since it's the CentOS uh, root, I now have yum inside it. So I have an Ubuntu box, but I have yum running. So it it all shares the same Linux kernel, but you could see that you could run whatever distro you want. So here at the end, I just I have another um, directory uh, Debian, and you, know, you could see the, the version. 
So now I have one Ubuntu, I think it's a 16.04 LTS version, but I've showed you three other uh, distros that I could run by using chroot. And chroot is um, the, one of the things that, that a container uses. You have file system, um, file system isolation, wherein where you're inside it, you can't see anything outside of it. However, uh, it's not built for isolation. So you could see, you could not see different files outside, but you know, you could see other processes as I will show you later on. But this was <laughs> old technology, like uh, released in 1982, uh, and it was used mainly for testing or for building software uh, where you don't want to use any dependencies. So it's like having your pristine OS inside your existing OS. So the third description is namespaces and cgroups. And this is the, the, the meat of, of the topic and what containers really are, are namespaces and cgroups. These are kernel features. So if you've heard about namespaces and cgroups, namespaces, you're, when your processes run inside a namespace, they think they're on their own system, right? They don't think that there's a, another system um, you know, they don't see the host, they're, they're, they, they see their, their own uh, system. So a container, you could look at it as a different root, a namespace, and a C group, right? So there are tools to create namespaces, uh, but we'll look first at the higher level, uh, higher level tools uh, that, that create namespaces. And these are the things that people are familiar with. Uh, call them the container runtimes, uh, LXC, for example, um, you know, it has been popular uh, and it has existed before Docker, right? Uh, Docker at the beginning was using LXC to create a container. So they, it, it was just a wrapper. For sure, it provides a lot of different um, advantages, but at the beginning, uh, it, it was using LXC. And then you also have Rocket, SystemD, and Spawn. But in the end, you're just creating namespaces and C groups. So none of these uh, tools uh, added new features to, to the kernel. They, they are using uh, namespaces and C groups. So when you're in a container, there's an illusion to the user that you are on a different OS. As I've showed you earlier, you, you, know, you think the process thinks it's in, in its own OS. So and that is the goal for, for what we, um, for, for the containers, right? So here we'll see the CH root again. Uh, I'm using Ubuntu 17.04, and you would see that inside it, um, I could see all the different processes that are running. I just cleared the screen very quickly. But I could grab for top, I could see that process inside that root, and I could kill it, right? So if someone in the host was running top, and I'm inside the, the new root and I killed it, then, well, um, I'm sorry to that person running top. So what namespace does, right, um, namespaces, what they do is provide you that isolation. So first, let's look at uh, the PID namespace. Um, so I'm going to introduce a, a, a tool called Unshare, uh, or a program called Unshare that would create the namespace. So I'm going to combine that with um, with CH root, so I'm going to say unshare, make a new uh, namespace for, uh, for a PID namespace, CH root Ubuntu 17.04, I'm using the same thing. I'm going to mount the proc file system, and after I run PS, um, you would see that I only see the batch process and the, act, the, the PS process. So now inside it, well it thinks it's PID uh, number one. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's not uh, you know, process number one in the host system, it's something else. So it's just mapped to something else, but inside that namespace, which we created using Unshare, it thinks it, it is uh, PID number one. So now you've created a namespace that can't, um, can't kill the processes that are running on the host. And why is this important? Uh, when people run containers that are um, that were created by someone else, you don't want that container to be able to go to the host and just kill any process, right? So, next is the mount namespace. 
So when you create a mount namespace, uh, you, you inherit all the mount points of the server, of the host. But then when you make changes to it, um, the host won't be affected. So why is that important? So when you create a new container or a new namespace, Docker, for example, changes the mount points for proc, sys, and dev, and so the containers won't have access to, to, the, hosts, uh, to the hosts. For example, here, the container won't have access to the disk. Why is that important? Well, if you have access to the disk, then you could corrupt it, and everyone running that container or every, every container running on that host would have a problem. So you don't want your containers to be able to access certain mount points, and that's where the mount namespace would help. Another namespace that we'll look at is uh, user namespace. And this is actually uh, relatively new, and even Docker uh, only added this, you know, maybe uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, so. But this is like PID mapping, uh, wherein when you're running inside a container, uh, you, when you're running as a user on a container, you, you are actually a different user on the host. So it's like PID mapping. So a lot of containers run as root inside, um, you know, you run as the root user inside a container. And that could be a problem because when you're running as root without user namespace, you're also running as root on the host. And you know why that, that's not good, right? Because if you have privileges on the host, then you could do a lot of different things. So when you enable user namespace, you'll have root inside a container, but you won't be root uh, outside. So you're not, you won't be root on the host. Next is the network namespace. Uh, and inside a container, you will use your own network interfaces. So it won't have any connection, but what, what, um, Docker does, for example, is create uh, VF pairs um, and use a bridge on the host. So now you have one pair on the container, one pair on the host, and so it will be able to, uh, you'll be able to have uh, your network connection. And we will show uh, later on um, how, how that works. And there are seven namespaces right now. Um, so we started with mount, and the latest is the C group namespace. And this is actually uh, more than 10 years in the making, right? So Mount was added at, uh, at the um, kernel 2.4, and user, for example, was added in 3.8, and C group recently was added in the 4.6 kernel. So it wasn't, you know, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a, just one time we're in, okay, we're releasing containers. They release namespaces, and they release it incrementally. Um, so let's take a look at how you're going to use everything, how you're going to combine everything to create your own container and run Rails inside it. So we, we're going back to, to our same example, um, you know, unshare, but now we're, um, oh, I'm just showing here that you have a, a typical Rails app on, you know, on user source app, uh, so we're going to create namespaces using unshare, but now we're going to pass mount, UTS, IPC, net, kid, and run chroot. So that it's what we've been running uh, this whole talk. Uh, and we're going to mount the proc, and then next I'm going to add a lot of environment variables, but these are just needed by, by my Rails app. Like they have database URL and secret key base. Uh, I'm gonna clear it just so it it's easier to see, and now I'm going to run bundle exec um, Rails server to run my Rails app. So I'm now inside a container and uh, running a Rails app, right? So I'm gonna try to curl and see if I could access that, and you would see that it would fail because I haven't set up the network bit pairs that I mentioned. You would see here there's only one loopback interface. So now I have to create those VIF pairs, right? So I'm on the second tab on the host, and I'm going to create the VIF pairs using the IP command. Um, I just use H for the host, H, PID, ID, and then C for the other pair. So now I have two pairs. I, I, I put the C 
one and put it on the process ID. So that's the container part. And then I put the H5140 on the Docker bridge that is running on the host. So now you would see that there are two network interfaces, right? So now I'm going to bring up those interfaces. So bring, bring up the loopback interface, I'm going to bring up the other, the one pair, one end of the pair, name it, name it if zero inside the container. Here I'm just going to add an IP address. Uh, of course, you want to be able to connect to, to your container um, using an IP from the bridge that I just chose randomly. And I'm going to add a route um, to be able to have connection, uh, routing it through the bridge. And after that, I would be able to uh, curl um, the Rails app inside the container. But know that I'm using one, uh, the local host, so 127.0.0.1 inside. But outside of it, in the host, you need to use the, um, the IP address that, that I used. So here you would see that the Puma process is running. Uh, that's the default now with uh, 5.1. And you would see that it's PID 9 inside the container, but it's a different PID out on the host. So this is the PID namespace uh, at, at work. So next is uh, C groups. So C groups are used to limit resources. Like you could, you could have uh, you could set a limit, uh, a memory limit, a CPU limit, or even access to devices. Um, you could also set a limit to the number of processes you can fork because you don't want to exhaust all the, you know, all the, the process, the number of processes you could run. Um, and, you know, these were, C groups were added uh, on the 2.6 kernel. So let's uh, take a look at how you're going to set a memory limit uh, to that. So the, at the beginning, it's just the same. Um, you know, we, we just create the namespaces. Uh, so we're, we're doing the same thing at the beginning, um, creating the mount UTS uh, namespaces. And then I'm going to mount the proc. And then the environment variables that Rails need. But before running, uh, before running the before running Puma, we're going to use C groups to to set up a memory limit. So here I'm using uh, C groups and no bricks. Yep. So here I'm using the sysfs C group memory, uh, which is um, the C group file system. Uh, it's already mounted. On, on my box, uh, I think it was done by systemd. So unlike namespaces wherein you use unshare as the, as the program that create namespaces, with C groups, you actually just interface with, with a, a file system, with, with the C group file system. So I create a directory, uh, create the Rails directory, um, and you would see that if you, you know, I just created a directory, but after creating it, it creates all these files for me. Uh, and those are the limits that I could use. Uh, you would see memory limit uh, there and other, uh, other things. So what I need to do now is get the process ID of uh, my container. Uh, so I, I'll get the process ID of bash. Um, so that's 10458 there and I'm going to put it inside Rails uh, slash tasks. And tasks on, um, on C groups are, are the processes, right? So I'm saying process 10458 should be under the Rails C group, right? So there's nothing special with this. I created the Rails C group, right? Um, and I'm going to say um, 40 megabytes uh, will go to Rails memory dot limit in bytes, right? So who wants to guess if that's enough for a Rails application? This is a very basic Rails application. Uh, so now I'm back to my container and I'm going to run 
Puma, so I'm going to run bundle exec uh, rail server, and it says it's killed, right? So without, I mean, with a, with a limit um, of 40 megabytes, the, our, our Puma process can start. So now I'm going to increase that to 80 megabytes, and let's see if it works. So this is a, a new Rails app, so I think this would do. Uh, this would work, right? So now you could create a, uh, you know, you could run that process, and you would see here that Puma is running. Um, so that's that's how you use C groups with, um, with with your Rails app. So next description and the last one, and this is the most the the most accurate description is containers or processes. So you you might have. For this, they're not VMs, they are processes. And this is the, you know, the correct description. Um, and if you take away um, nothing else from this stock is, um, you know, you could run a lot of processes as you know, but containers make it easier um, to, to run those processes together on the same host. So let's uh, take a look at this. Um, next uh, video, uh, you can see that I have a lot of uh, Puma processes, right? So, and then I, I'm just showing you that the PID, I'm not sure if that's easy to read, but the PID namespaces, so you could check the namespaces on, on the proc file system, they're all different. So I'm just showing you that these processes are all in different namespaces, right? But they are in namespaces, and what's interesting is I have a lot of Puma processes running, and I don't have even Ruby installed on the host, right? So your host doesn't need to, to have anything. In fact, uh, there's an OS, uh, Core OS, or I think they've renamed it to Container Linux, that, even, that doesn't even have a pack, uh, package manager because they, they want you to run everything in containers. So here I'm trying, okay, run all the Puma processes you want. Uh, I think I'm using the same version, so this is the same container. But you could run whatever Ruby version you want, whatever app server you want. You could, you know, mix and match, you know, Puma, Unicorn, and it, 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 it all, containers make it all easier uh, to, to do all of that. So, you know, uh, containers are processes. But containers being a new root, uh, having namespace and C groups, uh, they're not actually enough. Uh, we have, whenever you create containers, you have to make sure you, you know how to secure them. So let's talk about uh, container security. Uh, the, the, the way security works with containers is you apply layers of them. There's just no one setting uh, that would make all your containers secure. Like you have to run a number of different things to, to make sure they are secure. Uh, for example, um, we have App Armor. Um, this uh, Linux security module, or if your host doesn't support it, uh, SE Linux, uh, and it limits the actions that a given program can take. So it, it provides a lot of limitations on, um, on the container, but actually, if you start using the user namespaces, um, a user namespace, some of this, um, some of these restrictions from App Armor are not needed anymore, but you know you still keep them, so you, you just have another layer of, uh, of 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 security. So next is capabilities. Um, in the beginning, there's only a, a root and non-root. Uh, if you're a regular user, you you, you don't have um, access or you don't have privileges privileges to do a lot of things, and. <laughs> Linux introduced capabilities so that a regular user would be able to do something if it has privileges, uh, some privileges, some capabilities, but not, you know, but not uh, a full-fledged uh, uh, root user. So containers need some capabilities, but you you don't want to give them all the capabilities. Uh, so that's why you also shouldn't run your containers as root. Uh, and while when limiting capabilities for some containers, then you, you limit what, what those containers can do. Um, however, how do you know which capabilities to restrict containers and uh, which capabilities not to restrict? 
In fact, there, when you search GitHub, for example, on Docker, you know, there's a, there's a lot of discussion on what capabilities to, to, um, to allow or to deny. So it's, there's no one answer. Like, when you go to, when you use LXC, they, they give you some set of capabilities, and when you use Docker, uh, they give you another set, so it's, you know, it's different. Uh, and the other is um, SecComp. Uh, so this is a Linux kernel feature, uh, and it filters system calls, and Docker, for example, disables 44 system calls out of 300 plus. Um, like one example of a system call it blocks is open by handle add, because when you use that, you could escape the container. So then the, you know, the, the solution is just to disable that system call. But again, which settings do you, you know, should you block or should you disable? So those 44 system calls, how did they arrive at, uh, at, at those lists? It, you know, it comes from years of, of, of running you know, the Docker project and to know which, uh, you know, which system calls uh, to block. Like at the beginning, if there's a, a vulnerability, uh, you know, some system calls will have to be disabled. So um, the last part is uh, running containers in production. So I've shown you, you know, main spaces and C groups. So I hope I've convinced you to look at main spaces and C groups or containers um, to run to run your Rails app. But I hope you don't go, you know, from this talk, you know, creating name spaces and C groups on your own, like running on share, and because most likely that would be not secured and will have a, a lot of bugs. For example, I've shown you ch root, but that's not even actually what Docker is using. They're using pivot root, which is more secure than ch root, because as, as I said, ch root wasn't meant for, for isolation, right? So you don't write your own. It's like, I think it's like cryptography, right? You don't write your own, you, you let the, the pros do it. Um, so you use a container runtime. Uh, I've shown you Docker and Rocket, and that, that's actually good. If you're going to start running containers in production, that's the first step, uh, because they would create the, the namespaces, C groups, and they would have default security for you. But then you'll also have other problems, right? Uh, what if the Docker daemon dies? And, you know, I've had to restart Docker a lot of times and, you know, all your containers are gone. Like, well, what do you do with that? Like, the site would be down and, you know, it'd be bad. Um, so you use something on top of it, you know, a, an orchestration uh, system. And here you would have Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker Swarm, uh, you know, you could choose, I mean, we like Kubernetes. Uh, when you run your containers, this system would choose the host with resources, right? So if you have 10 servers and you say, I, hey, I want to run this Rails app, then, or this container with the Rails app, and then Kubernetes would choose, okay, you run it on this host because it has uh, memory. And then when a host dies, when a, when a server reboots or, you know, becomes inaccessible, um, Kubernetes would then, oh, all the containers that are running on this host, I'm going to move them to, to another host. So with just the Docker, with, with just the container runtime, you'd have to manage that yourself, right? So if, that's why even Docker has Swarm, because they know it's you know, just running Docker on its own in one server is not, it's not enough. Um, then Kubernetes also provides zero downtime deploy. Uh, you know, if you have containers, then you you know, you want to be able to create new containers and with, with newer versions. But all of this, you still need an image, right, which I didn't um, um, talk or gave the, the technical details. You still have to create that image, right? Uh, I tell you, install Ruby, install the packages, copy your code, install the gems, but, you know, how do you do that? And some people, they just don't want to do that. Of course, you could automate this, right? You know, a lot of you are using, or more than half are using Docker or containers with Docker, so you know, you could use Docker build. Um, and there's a lot of autom automation that you could use. Uh, you could tie them up with your, 
with your CI, for example, and you could have an image. But what if you don't want to, you know, to think about all this, right? That's like when you're a developer, you, you don't want to, to think about containers, C groups, namespaces. Um, then you could actually uh, use a platform, right? There are a lot of open source projects for this, uh, Days, OpenShift, wherein you just, you don't need an image, you just push, right? You, you run a command like um, um, git push or the Cloud Foundry CF push and your app would be sent to the platform and it would run containers for you. But in that case, the, the containers are just implementation details, right? Like you don't care that they're running containers. It, I just care that it works and I just care that if I push my app, I would you know, see the new version and scale automatically. <laughs> and yeah, that is the goal. So you now know about namespaces and C groups, but you don't even have to, um, to use them. And in fact, uh, Engineard, uh, so this is the, just a plug, uh, Engineard has a platform that, that does that, or will have a platform that does that, and there would be a, an announcement, uh, we have a keynote on Thursday that, where you will hear more about it. So we work uh, on that level. Actually, uh, we had a workshop at Kubernetes, so we could actually also work at the orchestration level, but you know, most people would just like to push their app and just be done with it. So, um, yeah, in closing, I mean, deploy your Rails app in a container. Uh, look into the technology. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's mature enough. A lot of people are, are, are using containers. Um, it's, it also has a long way to go, like databases. I, do, I think you should not run your, your databases yet in containers. It is possible, but it's still, uh, you know, early. Um, and that's it. Thank you.